This video will be going over section 3.2, which is on domain and range. <clears throat> For the main topics, we'll look at tables and graphs of functions, talk about their domain and range. And then the main thing we'll be dealing with is the domain of a function with a formula. Now, one thing I'll say right now before we get there, uh, we don't really ever talk about the range of a function with its formula because it's very hard to figure out. Um, the domain, or sorry, the range of a table and a graph is much easier because you can see what's going on. All right, so we'll start with the domain of a table, in range of a table, rather. So to begin, we say the domain is all the x values, the inputs, the independent variable, whichever one you like to think about being used in a function, and the range is all the y values, or the outputs, or the dependent variable. So we'll look at this table down here to write its domain and range. It says the function g of x is defined by the table below. Give the domain and range of g of x. Give your answers as sets. So that's the curly brackets mean whatever you put inside it's a set and closed in the curly brackets. So you don't have to add your own curly brackets. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So the domain is all the x values. Now one thing that you want to make sure you don't do when writing the domain and range is if there are values repeated, don't include the repeats more than once. So the domain has no repeated x values, but you can just write down negative 12, 6, 31, 36, 41, and 49. Since there's no repeats, where I'm just going to write them all in the answer spot. Now, as far as the range goes, I'm just going to list them, you know, as I read through them, 32, the y values, then 23, then 33, then 33, then 13, then 21. All right, pretty much just rewrote the question. I just didn't want to <coughs> draw on the actual question for the notes. But since 33 is repeated, only use it once. If you use it twice in your answer, I'm pretty sure it'll be marked wrong and it's not correct. Uh, but the rest are not repeated. You don't have to write them from least to greatest or anything like that. You can just read them off 32, 23, 33, 13, and 21. The one thing you just got to make sure of is you do not include the 33 twice. <clears throat> right, as far as the table goes for domain and range, that's it. There's nothing more to it. The table can look different ways. It could be vertical instead of horizontal. We could have set of ordered pairs instead, like the last section. <clears throat> now, for the domain and range of a graph, um, they're a little bit different because um, when we look at a graph, it's not just going to be spots. It's going to be like curves and stuff. And because of this, we often use set builder or interval notation. And I'll look at both of them as we go through the problems we have. And you can see that we just have two problems here. <clears throat> so it says for the following, write the domain and range in both interval and set builder notation. Set builder notation is the one that's less commonly used, but when you look at the problems, it seems like it's more obvious to use. It's just not as useful. Um, occasionally, set builder is also called inequality notation. All right, but when we're looking at the domain, we're looking at the x values being used. And the range is the y values. <clears throat> right. And what I like to think about, you know, if I'm figuring out the domain of this, look how far left it goes to how far right it goes. That's going to be the domain. So the leftmost point is right here. It's an open circle. 
what I'm going to do is just draw it on the X axis. Open circle, then it's going to the right. I am just using the X values. Imagine this curve, this line was smashed against the X axis. And we go until we hit this point, which is at X equals two, and there's a filled in circle. Right. So as far as set builder notation, X, since it's an open circle, it's between negative two and two. Open circles do not have an equal sign, but closed circles do, or equal part on it, rather. All right, so that is the domain and set builder notation. <clears throat> you have to be careful on the homework. When you fill this out, make sure you do X for domain. And when we do the range, you have to make sure you do Y. Getting just the numbers correct isn't good enough. All right, now the domain and an interval notation, if you're not familiar or you can't remember interval notation, it sort of looks, starts to look like an ordered pair. You pick your number farthest to the left, comma, number farthest to the right. And you use a parentheses if it's an open circle. And if it's a closed circle like we have it too, then we put a bracket. And this is how internal notation works. All right. and internal notation is a prerequisite to this class, but if you're not familiar with it, it's not too bad once you practice a couple. <clears throat> Now for the range, we do the same thing, but for the Y values. And since uh, the, the smaller Y values are at the bottom, what we do is we smash our line up against the Y axis, but we start from the bottom. Because we always wanna put the smaller number first. Now when we smash it, the bottom number is where the closed circle is, and we're going up, 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 up until we get to the open circle, which is at y equals 5. <clears throat> All right, and as far as the range goes, the inequality or set builder notation, negative 3 is our smaller number. It's been, it, the y values are, are the range. 5 is our bigger number. And three has a closed circle, so it's included. We put an equal part on it. And for the interval notation, we put our smaller number, negative three, comma, our larger number, five. Since negative three is included, we put a bracket. And then five has an open circle on it, so we put a parentheses. But that is set builder and inequality and interval notation, and that's how we figure out the domain and range from a graph. Now the next one is very similar, but I want to make sure you're not um, messing up. It's um, pretty easy to mess up the range if there's a lot of parts to the graph like this, because your eyes want to go start from the left and right, not the top and bottom. Um, but I want to do the same thing as before. So the domain look as far left. We have a closed circle at negative 5. And it's going all the way until we get to 4. And we have another closed circle. All right. So the domain, our smaller number is negative 5. We're dealing with x. And our larger number is 4. And they both get equal signs because they both have filled in circles. And then for interval notation, 
we do our smaller number, negative 5, comma, our large number, 4. And since they're both filled in circles, we get brackets for both. Now the range, the thing I'm mentioning you want to be careful on, you don't want to look over here because this isn't the bottom of the graph. The bottom of the graph is down here. Imagine smashing this against the y-axis, the bottom would be here. And the top of the graph would be up here at 3. Now the question is, this isn't, the bottom of the graph is not where the end of the graph is. So there's not a drawn in filled or open circle. If you're not at the end of a graph, then you have filled in circles everywhere. We just don't draw them in. In order to have a not filled in circle somewhere between the two ends, you have to actually have that open circle drawn in, which we do not. Now that we have filled in circles for both, the smaller, the smallest y value is negative 5, range is y values, the largest y value is 3, and once again they are both filled in like the previous one, so we get equal signs on both and the range and interval notation we have negative 5 comma 3 both filled in so they both get brackets All right so the last part of the section which is the main part we'll spend probably you know twice as much time on this as the other two combined the domain of functions given formulas All right, so the last kind of function we want to study for the domain is one given a formula. In general, it's very hard to find the range by just the formula, so we won't be doing that. You're not missing anything out. I don't even know when the first time I answered that question of what the what is the range to a function. It certainly wasn't until after calculus. All right, so most functions we see have domain all real numbers written as negative infinity to infinity and interval notation. The reason for that is because you can plug in any number. The domain is the x values which, when plugged in, make the output a real number. So what we're going to talk about first is there's really two exceptions to the rules as far as this point of the class goes. You know, when is the domain not all real numbers? Right. So the two exceptions, the first one is when you have even root radicals. If you have an even root radical, the number inside must be at least zero. If the number inside the square root, for example, is negative, you get an imaginary number. It's not a real number. So to determine the domains of these, we set the inside greater than or equal to 0 and solve. All right, that'll give us an inequality for our domain. And then we'll transfer that inequality to interval notation. Now, the interval notation for these is a little more challenging are a little more different than the interval notations above, but it builds on the same thing. All right, so for the first function, we have f of x equals the square root of x. By even root radical, what we mean is the number on the radical is even. When there's not a number written there, it's an invisible 2. So it's even. All right, so what we do is we take the inside, set it greater than or equal to 0, and solve for x. Now this one's already solved for x, because we have just x inside. 
So now what we want to do is we want to write this in interval notation. And when you're doing interval notation, it's usually a good idea to make a number line. Mark off all the numbers that are important, which here is just zero. And then you want to do a couple things. You're either going to have an open or a closed circle at your number. This one is included. We have an equal part, so it's the closed circle. And it's greater than, which means it's to the right. And so we're shading in this. This is our answer visually. The way we write this, think about when we were doing our domain before, we asked how far left are we? Well, the farthest left is zero and it's a closed circle. And the farthest right it goes, there's nothing stopping it. It's going to go all the way to infinity. Oops. So it, it can go on forever to infinity. Now the important thing here is infinity and when we run across negative infinity as well, always get parentheses because they are not real numbers. You can't actually use them. And you'll see it's very common. It's very common in this um, section to get infinity as part of your answer. All right, so the next one is a similar idea. We just have something different inside it. You'll see that it is an even root radical again. The number is eight. So what we have to do is we take the inside negative three X plus seven and make it greater than or equal to zero. This one, we have some work to do to solve for X. Now it's up to you how you do this. You can always add or subtract across inequalities. I'm going to subtract the seven on purpose. You could add the three X to the other side, but I just want to remind everyone of something. So subtracting and adding do not change the inequality ever. All right, so we got negative three X is greater than or equal to negative seven. Now we divide each side by the negative three to get X by itself. And this is where you have to be careful on. If you multiply or divide by a negative number, you must flip the inequality. Okay, so here we're left with just x on the left. This gets flipped from greater than to less than. The equal part always stays. If the equal part's not there, it won't be there. You're literally just flipping the sign. And then over here, the negatives cancel. We got 7 over 3. All right. But once we're here, we are solved for x, and now we make our number line to get the interval. So mark off our number line, only 7 thirds matters. We use a filled in circle because there's the equal sign and less than means smaller than. 
which is the smaller numbers are to the left. Then for our answer, the interval here, the farthest left we go, well, it's going left forever. So it really starts at negative infinity, which gets a parentheses. And it goes all the way up to 7 thirds. And that filled in circle gets a bracket. Right, so that is interval notation um, dealing with infinities and also if you have an even root radical so an even number on here that's how we find the domain now i'll have an example later but when that number is odd it's not one of these two problems so it's going to be a infinity to infinity right. the second exception to our domain being all real numbers is functions with x in the denominator. If you have x in the denominator, it may be possible that some x values make the denominator zero. The reason that's bad is if you're dividing by zero, it's not a real number. Right? If you do five divided by zero or anything divided by zero, you get an error. Right, so in this case, what we do is we set the denominator equal to zero, solve that, and then those are the x values that we do not want to use. So we'll work a couple problems here. So it says determine the domain of the following functions, give your answer in interval notation. Right, so what we're going to do, we don't care about the numerator at all. We only care about the denominator because it has an x in it. We want to set that equal to 0 and solve that. Right, so we know when there's just one thing for x, we can get the x power by itself. So I'll subtract a from each side, we got x squared equals negative 8. Then to get rid of the square, we know we do the square root plus or minus. And what happens here? Well, we have a negative inside of square root, so there's no answers. So what is this telling us? Well, the x values, our answers here would be the numbers we throw away. Since there are no solutions, we don't throw away any numbers. And even though this one has an x in the denominator, the domain is still all real numbers. Now, this is a special example where you get no solutions when you set the denominator equal to zero. That doesn't happen too often. But just because you have an x in the denominator doesn't mean your domain not, might not be all real numbers. Still can be. All right, so the next one will definitely have some numbers to throw away. Once again, we see the x in the denominator. We want to get the domain. We do not care about the numerator at all. We just set the denominator equal to zero. And solve for x. Right. So the, we, we see the different powers of x. We're going to want to factor this, but we have an x in common. We're going to factor out the common x. When we take an x out of x cubed, we get x squared. When we take the x out of 7x squared, we get 7x. And when we take the x out of 12x, we get 12. All right, it's already equal to 0. That's why I started factoring. And then to factor the next part, we have just an x squared there, which is nice. We can put an x in front. 
what two numbers multiply to 12 and add to 7? Well, that's 3 and 4. And now this is factored completely. We set each equal to 0 and solve. Don't forget about the front here. We got x equals 0, x plus 3 equals 0, and x plus 4 equals 0. The left one solve for us. The middle one we subtract 3, and we get x equals negative 3. The last one we subtract the 4 from each side, and we get x equals negative 4. And so these three numbers, 0, negative 3, and negative 4, are numbers we want to throw away. All right, so the way to visualize this on a number line is mark off your numbers here. So you got negative 4. Make sure you do them in order, negative 3 and 0. The spacing doesn't matter. Just mark them off in order. Now, since we're not using them, we want to throw away. They get open circles on them. All right, we do not want to use them. They get open circles. But we do want to use everything else, meaning we want to use what's to the left of negative 4, we want to use what's in between negative 4 and negative 3, between negative 3 and 0, and 0 to the right forever. All right, so our answer for interval notation here is going to be a little bit different than from before, because we're going to have four intervals. We have what's to the left of negative 4, well, what's to the left of negative 4? It goes all the way left to negative infinity and goes up to negative 4. Notice how the open circle is occurring, so we use parentheses. In fact, they're all open circles. And then the next interval from negative 4 to negative 3, both with open circles, so we use two more parentheses then negative 3 to 0, both with parentheses, and then the last interval of 0, right forever to infinity. Okay. And you're pretty much done here, but whenever you have one more than one interval in your answer, you do what's called a union, which just looks like the letter U. All right, so that is the union symbol. On the homework, if you hit that little up arrow to bring up the interval menu on the answer box, then there will be a U-shaped thing. That is your union. That's what you'll use. All right, but there is not a simpler way to write the answer to this. Every interval gets, you know, visual interval gets an interval down here. So we have four of them. And it's telling us exactly what we have. Skip negative four. Skip negative 3, skip 0. Right. Most of them have 1 or 2 that you would throw away. But this one just happens to have 3. All right, so those are the only two kinds of problems where we have any work to do. But you do have to realize in the other ones, the domain is automatically all real numbers. So I'm just going to look at a few examples to make sure there's no confusion. So it says determine the domain of the functions below. But really, we just ask ourselves, or we just tell ourselves, if there is no x in a denominator, or even root radical, then the domain is all real numbers. 
So if, if you look for those two things and you don't see either one, you're good to go. So this first one here, there's no radical at all. Not have to worry about that. We do have a fraction, but there's no x down there. That means the domain is all real numbers. We don't have any more work to do. The second one, there's no fraction, so there's no denominator. We don't have to look for x in the denominator. Here we do have a radical, but it's a cubed root. And that is OK. You can have all the odd roots you want. And you don't have any work to do. That means the domain is also all real numbers. Um, the third one here is probably the easiest one because there's no fractions or radicals. You don't really have to check anything. You don't have to be careful about anything. You might be familiar with what kind of function this is. It's called a polynomial. Um, but if you have only, if you have no fractions, no radicals, the domain is all real numbers. And so this last one is one that I just like to be careful on and make sure we see. Um, it doesn't have any fractions. It doesn't have any radicals. Something that kind of bothers people is absolute values, thinking there's something special about their, them. But as far as the domain goes, there's nothing special about them. So absolute values are OK. And therefore, the domain of this one is also all real numbers. All right. So there are quite a few questions in the homework that ask for the domain of stuff that is all real numbers. You don't have any work to do, and that's OK. You don't have to, you don't even have to explain it. You can just write it down. All right, but that is the domain and range section.